my name is Cara Rudden. I'm the owner, uh, skipper of a white fish boat here in Greencastle. 23 metre boat. Uh, we're now uh, sitting here on the uh, on the Queen's Port. As, as there's no one else, that's a yard that we have uh, myself and three other fishermen uh, built to, uh, so we can service our fishing gear. We also have a transport business here at the end as well that uh, that uh, it would be uh, the, the the main transport firm for moving fish from Greencastle to all over Europe and Ireland. Well, uh, I, 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 we're talking way back in the mid-70s. I, I can... Um, the um, school holidays, there's a salmon fishing here. It took place during the summer months here. And uh, there weren't a lot of work about at the time. We, we used to we used to come down during the summer holidays here and maybe get a, a berth on one of the small boats here and go salmon fishing. And it was always a few pounds for the, the summer, more money than you would have made ashore, that's for sure, you know. And from that then you would have got a test for the fishing and then uh, I would have came here, uh, would have got a job on the deck of, uh, I think the first boat ever I was on was the Christmas Tide. It was just newly built out of, came out of co a cove for a local man here called Willie Harrigan. And um, moved on to different boats there uh, on the deck and I, I bought my, my own boat then in the early 80s. The first boat, uh, a, a small white fish boat, a 56 foot white fish boat that would have fished the, all the local grounds here. Um, they, they, were, they, had, they were timber boats, they were old timber boats, and they, I suppose the uh, safety ways they weren't as, maybe <coughs> as good as they are today. They hadn't, they hadn't the capacity to go that distance, uh, to go long distance off the shore. Like, uh, as I say, they were timber and they were low horsepower boats, and so they were difficult, uh, difficult boats to, to fish in in bad weather. Like. My, I got a boat of uh, a boat of uh, BAM, Bordi Skawara. Uh, had boats that other fishermen had uh, had given up on, and they were uh, young fishermen could apply to buy them, uh, and that gave me my start with them. I, I got uh, an 86 foot boat, 82 foot boat, sorry, uh, uh, a boat called the Albatross, another timber boat, and I would have had her for about 13 years. Uh, uh, plenty of ups and downs in them 13 years uh, but f but fishing for that size of, with that kind of boat in them days was uh, was difficult there were harder there were hard boats to pay for there were they were more expensive to run than we were used to and there was a lot of having to go to new fishing grounds and learn the learn the job all over again you know uh, then I had another boat, uh, a boat called the Drake Namara, an 86 steel boat. I had her for three years. Um, same kind of fishing. B uh, BAM then was running a fleet renewal scheme uh, in early 2000. So I applied for that and I was, uh, got to go ahead for a new boat that was uh, um, a 30 metre boat that was built in Spain. Uh, purpose built for the job, so uh, I also had her for uh, 13 years as well. So uh, she she became hard to work at the end up with because of very high diesel costs at the time and uh, quota restrictions. The quota restrictions was the biggest problem. They had an awful they had a big effect because it it turned out that uh, the the smaller boat I have now has the exact same quota as that large boat that was maybe twice as hard to run. You know, so it wasn't it was. It was very difficult to, to, to keep that kind of boat going. It made no sense. You were just kind of working for the bank and the diesel man. So that was it. I had that a boat called the Catherine Orr, 23 metre boat. Uh, um, uh, it's, uh, as I say, a smaller boat. And uh, we we fish all around Ireland here, uh, wherever we have quota available to us. We, uh, we have to keep moving. As a, You can maybe get a couple of weeks at home here fishing and then you have to move to another area to, uh, to get new quota. As the quota is divided up in, in in areas around the country. Maybe there's a, maybe a divide of about four different, five different areas. You know, so we have to we have to keep moving as the quota. We don't have enough quota in this area to keep us fishing here all the time. Well, at the moment the boats uh, fishing west of Ackle, about 50, 60 miles west of Ackle, fishing for monk because come the end of the month we have much quota for anything else left. So he's, he'll be there for a week. I land back into Kelly Bay's, uh, 
we'll change some of the crew and we'll go back out again and we're not sure where we'll be the next time. Uh, it could be anywhere depending on quota, depending on weather. Sometimes uh, uh, we do a lot of fishing now in the Celtic Sea, which is south of Waterford and south of Cork and down that direction. Um, because of uh, um, uh, there's a, uh, there's a lot of white in there. At one stage, a good uh, they had, the fishing's very healthy there, and uh, weather-wise was the big thing too for my size of boat. There seems to be the weather's a bit kinder down there than it does in the northwest coast. Like, well, it's it, it we have a say it in our job. It all comes out of the cod end. Like that's the part of the net that the fish finally end up on once they've went, once they've went into the net. The cod ends their final stop before they come aboard the boat. So everything must come out of there. So the fish must go in there first. Uh, you, that's what pays your bills. Nothing else. There's, there's no other. It's, <laughs> there's, there's nothing else in the equation. It's all about what you catch, and how much you get for it. So you have to try to be at the top of your game all the time if you want to, uh, to pay the bills. But with us, it's not like any other business. The goalpost keeps you shifting. You don't know. You don't know from. One year to the next, what you what your grossing could be, or your your turnover for that year could be. Uh, just it all depends. It's in the hands of the fishery ministers in Brussels every year to tell you what quota you'll be allowed the following year. Uh, you don't know your running costs. That as we can see from fuels, our biggest bill there over the last two or three months, it has uh, risen by maybe twenty to twenty five percent. That's a huge uh, item for uh, for for a fisherman. So that that all has to be taken into consideration, and it's sometimes it's a, it's just like a walk on a tight rope, you know. It's a, um, and and something that the powers that be, I think, don't really allow for. They imagine that we're going out to a, a supermarket here, and we can go one place and get cod, and we can go somewhere else and get monk, and that that we can decide. But the mother nature's a way of telling us what we can do and what we can't. Uh, there's fish there one year, they're not there the next year. The weather's kind one year, it's not so kind the next year. So that's it's a balancing act as far as the finance is concerned. And, and when, it, when, when fishing's going well, it pays well. But um, Greencastle uh, and myself have seen some very bad years. Well, it, it's very hard to describe. Well, <laughs> I suppose everybody at some stage will know what it's like not to have money but uh, uh, when you're trying to pay bills and you have commitments to, to banks uh, and you must make your repayments banks don't want to hear that there's bad weather has been bad for the last month I've, I've seen us here in Greencastle with the older boats been stuck on here for to nearly three months like without anybody and the crew the crew would, would be the same they have while the boat's not fishing there's no one come whatsoever like. Uh, and that's a that's a tough it's a tough game, uh, and you would need to be uh, getting fairly good wages then when you are at the job, um, and that's becoming more difficult to do that too, because the, the the big thing is now that we have to go and find fish. When we find them, that used to be our job done. We could find them, we could catch them, we could bring them home. Now we can go and find them. And you can say, sorry, I have no quota, I must go in now and find some other species. You might only be allowed to take a fraction of what you found home. So that's the problem. So that 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 keeps going on. It's, it's, it's out of the, 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 the fishing has gone out of your hands as much as to say, you can't take home anymore what you catch. And some some cases actually have them alongside of the boat to take them in and realise that they're, you don't have quota for that species and you must let them go. Uh, and it's, that's a double whammy because you're after... You've killed some fish, uh, and there's uh, nobody getting any return for them. So you've, yeah, as I say, it's a double whammy then. Well, we have a co-op over here um, uh, that uh, that twelve of us set up a lot of years. There's always a co-op in Greencastle, a cooperation between fishermen as to selling fish. That was the idea that you would supply your fish to one set up and they would then auction your fish and sell it and, and organise the transport and all that's involved, all the logistics that's involved in getting the fish to market, which is becoming even more difficult all the time. You can, we have fish leaving Greencastle here every week that'll end up in Madrid, Barcelona, uh, <coughs> Paris, any, anywhere. Like they can, as far away as Belgium and, and at the same time local suppliers are at Kelly Beggs or Dublin or whatever will need their fish, you know, and there's local suppliers here in this area too. So, um, there's that all involved, so we're a co-op set up and we, we work together. We have our, 
There's certainly uh, we have our differences, but we, uh, we uh, the the co-op runs quite smoothly, and it uh, it does what it was set up to do, it's to sell our fish at the best possible price. Well, the fish would have been sold uh, to, um, for instance, the Dublin market was a big thing in the early years, where the fish every fisherman bringing his fish would be put on a lorry. Uh, that boat's labels or name would be put on the on their box of fish. They would go to the market and then they would be sold by agents on the market. But you were totally in their in in their hands. Then you had, if they said fish is a bad price, fish is a bad price. You had no you had no recourse. You had no options. You couldn't say, well, I don't want to sell my fish that cheap. Send them somewhere else. So nowadays you have that option. Uh, the manager of the co-op here, for instance, will uh, phone around different markets and and can even dictate what. What we land, we would say, well, now you don't be landing that type of fish because the market's not so good at the moment. But if you get some of them other type, we, we, we there is a strong market. So that's been uh, that's been helpful uh, to say the least because you're getting, you, you, as I say, I'll come back to the quota again. You must get the best return for that amount of allowable catch you have per month. There's no point bringing in stuff and sending to market, uh, using up your quota and then getting poor return for it. So it's all about maximising the return for what you've landed. It's been a lot of changes, huge changes, and as you say, in technology, but uh, people seem to think it's a bad thing that te technology has been... Uh, I suppose we've been we've been punished for our own success to a certain extent. Now, we, I think we've turned the corner, stocks are starting to recover again, but there was a period a few years back there where, where things were grim enough. Like, uh, um, Technology, I suppose, was part and parcel of that. We everybody just got too good at catching fish. Uh, uh, too many boats looking for fish. Um, just overfishing in general, and uh, as as I say, technology. But what what industry doesn't use technology? What you must have it if you, you every industry mo must move forward. Like uh, you can't stay in the past as much as a lot of maybe older fishermen or people would say, oh, we were better 50 years ago than we are now or 100. But nothing stands still. Like uh, everything moves forward, no matter whether it's farming or fishing or whatever. So that's it. The technology came in, made the fish easier to catch, uh, made us better at the job, and made us more effective. Uh, so that's the, that's the big the big thing technology done has made us more effective when we're on the water. The, the future is worrying, uh, I have to say. And but w no matter what fisherman you would ask, even you were asking him that question, if you had asked me 30 years ago, I'd certainly be saying the same thing. So we never seem to get out of this doom and gloom in this industry. It's always waiting for uh, some minister to change the rules somewhere along the line, or the EC change the rules, and with one stroke of a pen you can be left in a, a very bad place. So uh, it's it's very hard to know. I, I, I think we, we seem to have been demonised about the industry. Uh, I think we're nothing. Uh, one of the big things is nobody knows what the job is like. Uh, we get a lot of people telling us what way the job should be done. Uh, uh, we have a lot of people controlling enforcement, it's a big, big thing now. But very few, nearly none of those people know anything about our job. They've never been to sea. You can go to a farm any time and see how it's worked, but you can't see what happens on a fishing boat. And everybody imagines what they know what it's like, but it's nothing like what they imagine. It's, it's a tough job. Uh, um, it's hard work. And I, I think we're at a sta really we're at a stage where... A little support might go a long, long way. Uh, fishermen need to sit down with the powers that be. It'll be it'll be near impossible to achieve what I'm talking about. We need to sit down to the powers that be and talk about our future. And them seeing us as, as a partner, they've seen us as the enemy for far too long. We're something that has to be curtailed and have to be beat into ship. And, uh, I think the, the one of the biggest things I've... You see that salmon fishing I talked about? Yeah, this, that salmon fishing was wiped out. It was stopped that year, killing all the salmon boys. It has to be stopped. That happened here. All salmon fishing was stopped around the coast of Ireland. The stocks are still declining. It wasn't the fishing at all that was declining the stocks. It was seals or global warming or whatever. But we were the first in line. And it's always, uh, we seem to be always there for the, we, we get it in the teeth firstly. Uh, and they, they need to, we need to be seen as partners and uh, we ourselves need to step up to the mark as well, like, no question about it. 
I don't. Uh, I don't mean financial support. I mean from government bodies, especially. We, as they say, the the Department of Marine, uh, places like that. We seem to be at loggerheads with them all the time. It's it's never any other way. Like it's always at loggerheads. We're always trying to. Uh, stop the floodgates opening with more legislation, more stuff coming all the time and nothing ever stops. Like you can't say next year will be the same as this year. There'll be more rules, there'll be different. Uh, it's it's just endless. They're talking now at the minute about cameras aboard boats so they can watch us uh, every last minute that we're see. They know at the moment where our position is. There's somebody sitting looking at a big screen in Harbolan now in Cork uh, can tell me where my boat is and whether, whether it's fishing or whether it's not. Uh, every night at midnight we must enter our log sheet with exactly what we've caught uh, and when we land our fish, when this, the dockets that we get for our fish must be returned to uh, the fishery officer so that will match up with the log sheet we put on every night so that we can't be seen to be selling more fish than we actually booked in. Like. So there's all, there's, there's all sorts of uh, checks and double checks. Uh, and sometimes it can be hard work. The fishing, we would say now, has actually got to be the easy bit. They have beat us down with uh, uh, with legislation and all sorts of red tip. Uh, and it makes the job very, very hard. Very hard. Uh, it's, they need to see the job for what it is. And most of them, and I'll be quite frank, without a doubt, most of them is making them couldn't do the job. The more they're legislating for it and telling us what way it should be done, but the most of them couldn't get, uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't do the job, or uh, you know. Sure. Well, it, uh, it's it's too easy to say that it's just the Irish government's fault. Uh, it's certainly it comes from the EC down, and we have uh, uh, the, we have the a government that seems to be only too willing to to, to follow the, the rules to the letter from the EC. Uh, but I, I suppose it's a, a Europe-wide problem, really, and. While fishermen, as I said earlier on, as while fishermen are seen as the enemy, things will never change. We need to be seen as partners in uh, preventing overfishing, uh, conserving stocks, and uh, leaving an industry for the next one, uh, for the next group of people. When I came here to this industry first, there was a good industry. The people that were negotiating for us didn't see our fishing as a very valuable asset to the country at that stage, so it was sold down the Swanee for. Uh, we would, <laughs> fishermen will say, well, we sold down the Swanee to get the, uh, a better deal for agriculture or new roads or whatever. But it certainly was. We came out of the deal very, very badly. Like, very badly. So we've been, we've been fighting on that basic problem from day one. Uh, Spanish, and fish, Spanish and French fishermen coming to the coast, well, if they don't land back in Ireland, we have no way of knowing what was on their boat or what they caught in our waters. And now, as I say, if I land here four hours before I come to the pier, I must send notification to the fishery officers that I'm coming so that they have time to come to uh, make sure that uh, that what I said was on my boat is on my boat and nothing extra. But a French or Spanish fisherman can come fish wherever around the coast of Ireland and have no one check his catch. He goes back to France or Spain or whatever, and that's it. They have a much more lenient approach to the fishermen. I'd say that in France and Spain. In Spain, because in France and Spain, fish are seen as such a an important part of their diet, and it's 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 a delicacy, and uh, it's uh, it's a big thing. They hold it in very high esteem. Uh, so we in Ireland don't look at it the same. Well, they're supposed to follow the same rules, and <laughs> if uh, it's it's easy, it's not so hard to follow the rules if they're nobody checking you, like you know. We seem to be the best little Europeans in Europe, isn't it? And I think it's, and I think it's coming down the line we want to be first. But well, you can't knock. As I say, I don't want to give the impression that it should be a free for all here, but it should not be. Uh, as le lessons should be learned from the past that we have definitely made mistakes, but we have come a long, long way in a short time. Uh, the mesh size of nets, the conservation measures now aboard fishing boats have come a long way from when I started. Uh, less and less small on you know small fish being caught that are that are of no use that would be shoveled out again. Uh, what's known as dust yards. There'd be very little dust yards now going over the side compared to there was years ago. The mesh, the mesh of the nets now is big enough to let them escape and we have things that they call square mesh panels in the in the nets just above that cod end that I mentioned where small fish can escape easily. Uh, and that's been a huge success now, I have to say. And the other thing is, the the other side of the quota thing is that 
if you don't have enough quota now for an area, you leave. In years gone by, if you, uh, if, if you could catch whatever fish you wanted in that area. So now we have a set amount we can catch, we have to leave. So it, that in itself is, is conserving stocks. And we, we do see, uh, and it's, it's scientifically proven this stage, that stocks are recovering. Coming down the, the opportunities line. are limited. Because like uh, a lot of things, like a pub licence or what, uh, whatever, a fishing boat has a licence to go to fish. And there's only so many allowed, like pub licence. So, if you were a young man coming down the pier, like I was 40 odd years ago, I could come down, I came down then and bought a boat and went to fish. You can't do that now. You're buying the boat is only a small part of, uh, uh, of the cost. So, you have to buy your licence to put that boat to fish. Where do you buy it? Whoever's got it, maybe is not so keen on selling it. Uh, so, that's the big, big problem. So the young blood coming in, not so much young blood uh, as used to be. Uh, and that again for any industry is not a good thing. So uh, that's a worry. Men are not prepared, the crews are not prepared to go to sea anymore. Uh, twofold because there's good enough jobs ashore, good enough money to be made ashore. Uh, and who the hell wants to be away for a week at a time or maybe a fortnight at a time? Uh, work in the kind of hours and in the kind of conditions that we do. You you need to be making an awful lot of money to to, to justify that to yourself. So that, that that's one of the big ones. Uh, the crew and the inability of, of, of new men to get into the industry uh, is is the two biggest problems, like without a doubt. I don't see fish. I think fish dogs will get healthier and healthier as the time goes on. Uh, it certainly will. It, uh, anybody getting in now, it would be a good enough job for the future. Yeah. Definitely would. Uh, Greencastle, as I say, that fishing fleet when I came down here was the life bottle of this area, without a question or a doubt. When I came here first, there were 40 f fishing boats and there were uh, four and five men in every one of them. And that was, only, that was the men that went to sea. Uh, there was another uh, lot of local, small local filleting firms and net makers and net menders and different things and men working on the boats, engineers and... Uh, welders and whatnot. Uh, a lot of that has gone because the fleet has got smaller and smaller. Uh, equally, everybody is efficient as far as catching fish would be. I'm sure there's as much white fish coming in here now as there was when there were 40 boats here. And there's only half a dozen doing it now, six or eight maybe. So that's about that. Uh, I, I, it's very hard to see what the future holds, to be honest with you. Uh, I wouldn't like to call it anyway. <laughs> uh, I think maybe. Uh, it, 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 it'll be, it's, as I said to you before, it's very, very difficult to see how anybody could get in. But while there's fish, there'll, there'll always be fishermen. <laughs>